اس يو سي فيزو Uh, right, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Anna Raclariu, who will tell us uh, uh, about celestial amplitude from the UV to the IR. So please, Anna. Hi, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to talk about some uh, recent work with Nimar Kani Hamed, Monica Pate, and Annie Strominger. So uh, to begin with, in the past couple of years, Uh, we learned a lot about the asymptotic structure of gauge theory and gravity in asymptotically flat spacetimes. And uh, much of this progress has been triggered by work uh, from Andy and collaborators on uh, the relationship between soft theorems and asymptotic symmetries. And in particular, what this relationship is telling us is that soft theorems actually can be understood as arising um, as word identities associated with uh, large gauge symmetries. Now, one instance of this equivalence is uh, the subleading soft gravity theorem, which uh, taught us that um, Lorentz symmetry of uh, theories of gravity is uh, actually enhanced by uh, so-called super rotations. And uh, the, the word identities associated to these uh, asymptotic symmetries then gives rise to the subleading soft gravity theorem. Another aspect of this story is that one can also use these ideas to um, construct uh, a particular subleading soft graviton mode whose insertions in the quantum gravity S matrix behave like the word uh, behave like a stress tensor in a two dimensional conformal field theory. Now, uh, you may think, okay, maybe this is a bit surprising, but maybe it's not so surprising because, as I said, we already know that. Uh, theories of gravity have uh, uh, are Lorentz invariant. And uh, the way the Lorentz group acts in, uh, in four dimensions is uh, can, can be well recast as uh, the action of a global conformal group on, uh, on spheres at uh, future null infinity or past null infinity. And uh, so uh, again, also these ideas are also not, uh, not new. They've been put forward uh, Uh, by the Bird and Solodukin also a long time ago, who studied uh, Minkowski space, and they showed that there may be some uh, holographic description of Minkowski space in terms of some theory living on these spheres at infinity. Uh, so once one realizes this, perhaps it's not so surprising that, uh, that uh, the glo this global conformal symmetry in two dimensions actually gets enhanced to full Girasoro. What's more surprising is that this enhancement perhaps is manifest through, through this relationship. And this, this was not known, um, and it's only been shown a couple of years ago. Um, okay, so to make these ideas uh, a bit more precise, uh, the, there's been this work by Pesterski, Schein, Strominger, who uh, studied solutions to uh, the wave equation, essentially, in, in four dimensions. And uh, what, what they constructed was such solutions which instead of being moment, just the usual plane wave eigenstates were particular combinations, linear combinations of these, which transformed nicely uh, under, uh, in particular as uh, conformal primaries under the Lorentz SL2C. And uh, so this uh, led to this um, uh, kind of recent interest in uh, so-called celestial amplitudes which uh, as we'll see uh, in a moment are uh, nothing but just the reformulations of usual momentum space scattering amplitudes, but uh, in a basis of uh, boost eigenstates instead of standard momentum uh, eigenstates. Okay, so uh, the outline of the talk, uh, I'm gonna start by giving a, an introduction to uh, celestial amplitudes. So I'm gonna essentially make these ideas I just mentioned a bit more precise and I'm gonna be uh, describing the Uh, how to construct this conformal primary basis and uh, some, some of the properties people understand uh, about celestial amplitudes. And then I'm gonna uh, move on to the main part of the talk, which uh, is essentially just, uh, in some sense, it's, it's gonna be just an extension of these ideas. Uh, I'm just gonna show that, uh, I'm just gonna essentially uh, make this list of properties of celestial amplitudes a bit longer. And I'm gonna show that certain UV properties of uh, momentum space amplitudes can be mapped into uh, properties of uh, celestial uh, amplitudes. And in particular, if one studies 2 to 2 scattering, we're gonna see that 
celestial amplitudes have a nice analytic structure in the so-called complex uh, uh, boost weight plane. So we'll see uh, what I mean by this in a moment. And uh, at the end, uh, if I'm going to have time, I'm also going to discuss uh, a little bit what uh, soft hard factorization uh, in uh, for standard scattering amplitudes in uh, QED and gravity implies for celestial amplitudes. Okay, so uh, uh, the setup, the uh, setting we are in is uh, an asymptotically fed space time. Uh, and here we have a Penrose diagram for uh, such a space time. Uh, roughly speaking, what this is, <clears throat> is a, a class of space times which looks like Minkowski space uh, uh, near the boundary, so at infinity. And here we have the standard Minkowski metric. So these x mu's are usual coordinates in Minkowski space. Uh, it's going to turn out to be convenient to uh, um, do a change of coordinates to these so called retarded coordinates, u, r, z, and z bar. And the relationship is given by this equation. So essentially, of the, each of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of these two null vectors. Uh, so I should say this r is nothing but the standard radial coordinate in Minkowski space. U is a retarded times. So it's the difference between uh, t and r. And uh, z and z bar are essentially angles on the sphere. So one can trade them, uh, trade basically an angle on, on the sphere for a uh, uh, coordinates on the plane, essentially, by a stereographic projection. So uh, this is represented. So each of these <laughs> uh, coordinates can be seen uh, very explicitly on this uh, Penrose diagram. And in particular, this null vector. So we know uh, these uh, Penrose diagrams preserve the causal structure of space time. So a null line, um, this q hat, I should say, it's a null vector. It's a vector which points towards uh, a point on the sphere. And so if we have a massless particle freely propagating from past null infinity to future null infinity, it would be represented by this green line here. Um, now, um, other, uh, for example, a constant R line, uh, on the other hand, um, would be uh, represented by this uh, red line here. So distances are distorted. So uh, the idea is that, of course, here we have the whole Minkowski space time, all of it lies in inside this, uh, this diamond, which is finite uh, uh, region. Uh, and so as one takes R to infinity, uh, this line becomes closer and closer to the boundary. And in particular, uh, as one takes R to infinity for fixed U or fixed V, one reaches scry plus and scry minus respectively. So these are called future null infinity and past null infinity, and they are the places massless particles come from and go to, roughly speaking. Um, uh, I should also say that each pair of points on this diagram is a two sphere, and in particular, uh, cross sections of, let's uh, say, scry plus are going to be uh, spheres, and they are uh, represented by this uh, blue line here and labeled by these coordinates z and z bar. OK, so uh, the idea behind celestial amplitudes is that we'd like to reformulate scattering in an uh, asymptotically fed space times, um, just purely in terms of observables living on uh, these spheres. Uh, that in quantum field theory, one usually computes an S matrix in a basis of asymptotic states, which are typically taken to be momentum eigenstates. And these momentum eigenstates are labeled by uh, on-shell momenta. And one way to parametrize such an on-shell massless momentum is as follows. So this vector here is nothing but this Q hat I showed before, which points towards uh, some direction labeled by Zi and Z bar i. So naturally, in this parametrization, each of these massless particles is already naturally associated to a point on the, on the sphere. However, uh, of course, each particle is also labeled by an energy. And in order to, uh, to find some observables living on the sphere, we'd like to do something about this. 
And in particular, it turns out to be convenient uh, to trade these energies for scaling dimensions. And uh, this map, uh, I'm, I'm going to describe how to arrive at this map in a moment, but uh, the idea is that uh, one can take integral transforms, so so-called Mellon transforms, with respect to all of the external energies, and uh, um, essentially yeah, construct these linear combinations of, um, of momentum eigenstates to arrive at these so-called boost eigenstates. And they're actually, they're, they do actually diagonalize boost in the direction of these particles. And uh, uh, this leads to uh, the construction of this object A tilde from A. So A is the standard momentum space scattering amplitude. A tilde is going to be the celestial amplitude. And for massless scattering, this map is just given by uh, a series uh, by this product of Mellon transforms with respect to these uh, external energies. Now, uh, since uh, this is uh, the review part, uh, I want to motivate these uh, Mellon transforms, starting from the soft theorems. So uh, uh, the statement of the soft theorem is that if we have a scattering amplitude of n arbitrary particles uh, with momenta p1 to pn, and one, um, say, uh, graviton, so let's restrict the gravity in this case, uh, we have a graviton of momentum Q and uh, negative uh, helicity. And so uh, we can take, one can consider a limit in which the energy of this graviton goes to zero. And in this case, and it's been known and shown by Weinberg uh, many, many years ago, that, that the amplitude actually factorizes. So it's going to become a product of the amplitude without this graviton. So this is this an here. Uh, up to this proportionality factor, which is called the soft factor. And the leading piece here, um, so, so this is an expansion in uh, uh, powers of Q, essentially. It's a tailored expansion around the energy of this particle going to zero. So the first term actually turns out to have a pole in this limit. So we can see from this expression. The, the next term is order one in Q and so on. These dollar dots uh, stand for other terms in this expansion. But uh, the idea is that this leading factor has been understood. It's universal in the sense that it does not depend on what kind of uh, matter you're coupling to gravity. Uh, while the subleading term has only much more recently been understood. Um, and uh, this is going to be what we're going to be focusing on uh, now. So uh, let's uh, take this relation and project out this first piece such that one arrives at the relationship between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, just involving this term. So one can do this by acting with one plus omega d by d omega. So omega, I should say, is just the energy of this, uh, of this graviton. So act with this, take the limit as omega goes to zero. And what this does is basically it kills this term because this has a pole in omega. And what survives is basically uh, this piece. Um, and then what one can do is to act with a particular uh, uh, differential operator of this form on both sides again. And uh, the action of this on uh, this factor here. So, so z, again, z and z bar are the coordinates of q. And here, uh, we're integrating over them, right? To, to map, we're basically mapping uh, a vector which depends on z and z bar to one which depends on w and w bar. And what happens if one acts with, with this differential operator on this factor here is that one uh, generates, uh, basically this piece just turns into, uh, into a differential operator which uh, instead looks like this. But now this looks very much like, uh, this relation now looks very much like the ward identity of a stress tensor in a conformal field theory as uh, anticipated before. So to summarize, on the left-hand side, we constructed some uh, mode of the subleading soft graviton by acting with this differential operator and integrating it uh, over the sphere. And on the right-hand side, we just get the standard, we, we get uh, a differential operator which acts on the uh, amplitude without this graviton in this way. So one can in particular identify uh, identify this mode with some other operator, call it uh, TDD, and then we can put uh, this relation into this form. Sorry, Anna. Yes. Um, 
is there some physical signification to this uh, curly D operator you had on the previous page? Yes. So actually, this this later this has been understood as uh, taking from the celestial sphere point of view, it's like taking a shadow transform of a of a graviton. So yeah, th this is what it means. Uh, but the significance is well, once one rewrites. Uh, the way to see that this is going to work without actually uh, uh, knowing anything about like shadow transforms or anything is to just take go. I, I miss. I, I haven't uh, done a lot of steps here, but uh, historically, how uh, Andy and collaborators have shown essentially that uh, one can recast, one can arrive at this relation by actually um, uh, compute basically computing the commutator of the associated large gauge charges with the S matrix and imposing that these charges commute with this S matrix they arrive to this relation. And uh, in, in that proof, uh, what one usually, well, the way that works is that one parametrizes these P's and Q's and this J is an angular momentum operator. So it's again, expressed in terms of these PKs. Um, the, the epsilon is also, the polarization tensor can also be described in these coordinates. So one can just plug in these parametrizations in this expression and this expression then just becomes some ratio uh, of the form, you know, something like Z bar minus Z bar K divided by Z minus Z K. So then one can see that when you act three times with D by DZ, you sort of localize uh, uh, terms like that into delta functions. And, the, and then you can see that integrating, integrating against uh, carefully chosen vectors of this form then, uh, then gives this. Okay, so thanks. yeah, thanks for the question. Can I but, also ask yeah. a question? Oh, you hadn't finished yet, sorry. Can no, 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 I, I okay. have, well, there is maybe more to say, but. Um, I have a general question and I joined a few minutes late, so maybe you answered it in the introduction, but are these amplitudes not infrared divergent? Uh, I, I, will these things? I will discuss that at the end, but that's a great question. In, in, in four dimensions, they are infrared divergent. And actually here, there is a question. Here, I'm just talking about three levels, so there are no infrared divergences at this point. In, in this story, I'm just considering three level. Uh, oh, but the soft theorem was. The you soft, mean, these are all. These are these are hold more generally, no? That, yeah, they, yeah. Yes, I wanted to avoid that issue. The, the leading soft theorem, uh, of course, is uh, not corrected. Uh, the sub leading soft theorem can receive one loop corrections, as you as you are saying, and these one loop corrections, well. They have been shown that the, to be one loop exact. So the only diagrams one has to compute to, to compute the corrections are one loop diagrams. Um, however, as far, or at least as a few years ago, as far as I understand, people have worked out, they, they know what the infrared divergent corrections are. Mm -hmm. And those one can deal with actually by either the normalizing this object, the stress tensor, one can subtract from it a piece uh, such that basically just redefine a new stress tensor whose word identity just looks the same as this one, but with a different, you know, on the left-hand side, I wouldn't have exactly this object. So we looked at this a little bit uh, a few years ago. Uh, another alternative, which I think has not been quite explored is that uh, one can do the same, and it's probably gonna work. One can do the same kind of thing in a basis of address uh, asymptotic states, and then, from the get go, from the beginning, one just uh, gets rid of these. Well, one would expect to get rid of these infrared divergences, but I don't think that has been shown. And but then there are finite corrections, which I think are not fully understood. I think there are classes of diagrams which may contribute finite corrections, but yeah. Mm, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so. Uh, we arrived at this identity, uh, which looks like the water identity of a stress tensor in conformal field theory. But the, the caveat here for the usual, so again, at this point, I haven't done any Mellon transforms. These are just standard momentum space scattering amplitudes. Um, however, these HIs, which in conformal field theory would be just numbers, they would be the weights associated uh, with these uh, other operators. Um, 
here are uh, differential operators. So this SI is the spin of this particle and omega ID by the omega is some kind of scaling operator, which uh, will act, of course, will act on the amplitudes, but a general scattering amplitude won't be an eigenfunction of this operator. It's not hard to see that it won't be because one can, for example, do a low energy expansion of the amplitude, which generically is gonna be some sort of polynomial in these omega i's. And so these h i's will act non-diagonally on, on powers of omega i basically. Um, however, if one wants to, to bring this problem a bit closer to, uh, something which looks like a problem in conformal field theory, um, one can do this transform I described before. And essentially the role of this Mellon transform is, uh, is just to diagonalize these weights HI. Uh, it's, not, it, it's not that hard to see that if one uh, acts with uh, say omega J divided by the omega J on the amplitude and then takes the Mellon transform, does it, one does a transformation of this form. One can then integrate by parts to show that this relation holds. And so now we see that uh, if, if one does the same operation on, on this equation here, namely one takes Mellon transforms with respect to all of these uh, omega one to omega n, this relationship now is gonna be put in a form where these HIs uh, are now diagonal. So omega i by the, by the omega i can now be replaced by these deltas. And the deltas are dictated by whatever deltas you put here in this Mellon transform. So at this point I have not, they can be anything. Um, now, later, uh, one year later or so, uh, so Pesterski and Shaw and also with Andy, they studied uh, these Mellon transforms more carefully. And as I said before, they are just, um, uh, of course they will still be solutions so plane waves are solutions to uh, the scalar wave equation. And uh, these uh, phi's here defined by taking a Mellon transform of a plane wave will still be solutions, right? Because uh, I'm not, we're not touching the, this X coordinate here, which is a point, sorry, this big X is what I called little X before. It's just a point in space time. And this little X hat now is a, a label a point on the sphere. So one can explicitly compute the smell and transform of plane wave and it, it takes this form. And uh, uh, so yeah, one thing is that there are still solutions to the free wave equation. And the second thing is that doing this uh, then explicitly leads to this transformation prop. Well, yeah, one can, can study the transformation properties of these uh, uh, phi solutions under uh, uh, Lorentz transformations and one finds that they obey a relationship of this form, which is the same as the uh, transformation of a conformal primary in a, a conformal field theory. And in fact, this construction holds in any number of dimensions. But here we're just restricting to four dimensional space times where the celestial sphere is two dimensional. Um, and uh, the another fact which has been shown is that if one wants these uh, uh, these new solutions to also form a basis which is normalizable, then uh, these deltas have to lie on the principal series. So they have to take in in four dimensions they have to take the form delta one plus i lambda where lambda is the is the real number. But this condition is not going to be relevant today. We'll see in a moment that there are a lot of celestial operators which have dimensions which are not of this form. And in particular, the stress tensor is an, uh, such an example. Um, so of course, this will have just dimension two comma zero or zero comma two H and H bar. The usual, these would have the usual dimensions of the, of the stress tensor. So of course they, they won't have uh, delta one plus I lambda. Sorry, does the sign of lambda correlate with the sign of the frequency? The sign of lambda correlates with the sign of the frequency. No, actually, uh, the sign of the frequency. Oh, oh, sorry, so with, with plus or minus, uh, yeah. It's the plus of or minus label, yes. And actually, this, the, how, how whether it's an incoming or uh, outgoing state, it's just reflected by this epsilon description. So lambda will be positive for incoming, say, and negative for outgoing, or vice versa. Um. One can perhaps do such a separation, but I don't think one has, no, I think lambda, 
yeah, no, lambda is not restricted to be positive for incoming and negative for outgoing. But one can perhaps, I mean, there are, there are still open problems, I should say, about the spaces, which we can discuss maybe later. And the one, there could be such a split like the one you're mentioning. Uh, maybe just a comment. The, the positive and the negative lambda uh, conformal primal wave functions are paired in a sense that this may be similar from the, the plane wave ones. But as, as Anna just said in the line here, to, in, in the second to last line, you, the delta doesn't say which, I mean, which sign of lambda you have, the i epsilon, and with the plus minus tells you which one is ingoing and which one is outgoing. Okay, okay, thank you. And also I should say that this lambda is real for scalars, but if one considers, one can of course generalize this construction for uh, uh, gluons, gravity, and like for other kinds of, uh, uh, for like, yeah, for spin one and spin two particles, for example, in which case this, uh, this lambda will lie in a slightly different interval. I think it has to be positive in that case, or one can restrict it as positive lambdas. For, um, the, for the massive case, right? The massive versus the massless scalar case. Uh, the in the massive case, it's only on the positive or the negative, depending on which uh, uh, basis you pick. Okay. But for the, if you just increase the spin, it's the same as here for the massless yeah. scalar. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, that, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so I, I should also say that this can also be, yeah, I got a bit confused. It can also be extended to massive particles, actually, in which case, yeah, as Andrea is saying, uh, the lambda is just uh, positive. Okay, so um, a few properties obeyed by uh, celestial amplitudes uh, are uh, listed here. So the first one by construction is uh, conformal covariance, global conformal covariance, which takes this form. It just follows from this transformation property I showed before. Uh, perhaps more interestingly is the fact that uh, celestial amplitudes also have an additional symmetry. Which, come from, which comes from translation invariance in the bulk. So momentum conservation uh, tells us that uh, celestial amplitudes obey a relationship of this form. Um, so one thing to notice is that since boosts don't commute with translations, uh, these operators we just defined using the smell and transforms are not gonna be eigenstates of momenta. So moment, momentum shifts uh, the dimension by one. Um, and uh, if one then imposes that the sum of the momenta acting on the celestial amplitude is equal to zero, one arrives at the relationship of this form which uh, relates celestial amplitudes with uh, operators, with insertions uh, of operators with dimensions differing by one. And this, uh, uh, of course, this is not something we're familiar with from conformal field theory. So it's uh, an additional relation, an additional symmetry. And it's been shown that uh, it constrains the form of the four-point function uh, to, to, be, to, take, to take this form. So this is just a conformal equivariant prefactor, um, which comes for, sort of from this first uh, part of the story. Uh, the remaining piece has to be a function of the conformally invariant uh, cross ratio Z. Uh, in, but, but generically, that's it. If, if one just had global conformal symmetry, then, then this would be it. And this function of Z in particular could depend in any arbitrary way on the external weight. Here, on the other hand, uh, just the Poincare symmetry, and it's been shown in, in the squares here, uh, actually restrict this function farther to just be a function of the sum of the external dimensions. So delta here, I'm calling the sum of external dimensions. And this is gonna be very uh, important in what I'm gonna be discussing later because uh, we will be studying the analytic structure of, uh, of essentially these functions in this complex delta plane. And again, I'm not restricting here to, to delta being uh, of this form, you know, here it will be four plus I lambda, or four plus I in sum over the lambdas. We're not doing that. Oh, weird, sorry, what's going on? Okay, this has not happened before. I'm not sure why the next slide is. Uh, maybe I can just stop sharing and share again. Uh, is that okay? Sure. Yeah, sorry. Hmm.
Okay, so let's see. Sorry about this. I'm I'm not sure why it's doing this. I mean, it should obviously have all the slides in it. Okay, so okay, great. Uh, two more properties, which um, selection amplitude. Sorry, sorry, excuse me, but in the previous formula, um, um, sorry, those epsilon i's are whether they're they are incoming or outgoing. Is that the idea? Ah, yeah. I should sorry. I I should have said uh, these epsilon i's are just signs. Yeah, depending on whether they are incoming or outgoing. That's right. So so they carry these selection operators would also carry some kind of labels. So when one acts with translations, you would get a plus or minus sign depending on whether it corresponds to an in or an outgoing part. Okay. Okay. And so what what you mean is that the four point functions, if I just shift the scaling dimensions, some of them I shift up, some of them I shift down preserving this delta then uh, uh, I can oh. I can con in the last line right here in the last line so yeah so there's many correlators which look the same sorry can you say that again you you're said saying you're saying that the, these correlators of different operators with different scaling dimensions if as long as these scaling dimensions add up to the same thing the correlation function will be the same this is what as you're saying. Long as, so again, as long as this f is just a function of a sum of the weights, one can show. So in particular, I, I have skipped this. I was planning to, to say a bit more about this in a moment. But the point is that this is not, first of all, this is not the unique conformally covariant sure. structure one can write down. One can write down the other one, which is more familiar from like conformal block decompositions and stuff like that. But the reason I'm writing it this way is that this by itself is Poincaré invariant. So if you shift if you take this and shift, you know, delta one by one with the delta two, delta three, delta four fixed and add to it the same things with, you know, delta two and delta three and delta four shifted but by this one. Depends, but this depends on which particle you choose to do. So it's two, two, two scattering, right? Yes. Uh, this is actually, this, uh, this is for two, there. yes, exactly. Sorry, this is for two, two, two scattering, yes. Okay. And, and, uh, this uh, you have to take yes you have to decide on incoming and outgoing particles yes yes okay but it's all yeah this is symmetric in i in other words this is symmetric in ij right this this prefactor is symmetric in ij so if you shift to and add with take the, the corresponding sign it's, it's still it's it's going to work. Yeah, because it's two two two, but two 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 is anyways the only physical one for. Uh... But also two two two, of course, of course, for higher point scattering, one is not going to be able to write the celestial amplitude. It's just a function of one cross ratio. I mean, this this is. Uh... Oh, I should say. Okay, I missed. I'm just saying that in principle, there's two right. There's U V Z and whatever. But here, actually, momentum conservation also restricts the four point points to lie on a circle. So actually Z is constrained to be real. So Z is equal to Z bar in this case. There is a delta function in Z minus Z bar, which is actually part of this function. I should have said that. Uh, but I, I was gonna I was gonna show it later. But the, uh, I'm not sure if this answers the question, but basically one can show that the, that this relation implies that the, this this has to hold, where this function of Z, if one strips off this particular factor, this function of z can only be a function of ah yes because this is um well one way to see it let me see here is an easy way to see this uh, ah yes essentially because this is comfort because this is Poincare invariant so because this factor is uh, invariant under translation then one can see that if you just shift since this depends on, on, on just the sum of the external dimensions, if you shift two of them by one uh, and then subtract the other ones also shifted by one, you're always gonna, you're gonna get, you're gonna get zero. I, I, I'm not sure if I, I probably have to write it down, but. No, okay, yeah, I think I, I see it. So the structure of the Hilbert space is that you have these operators labeled by, uh, by the principal series, and then you have these, 
uh, I don't know what to call it, this translation uh, descendant uh, states who's the, who, where the real part of the dimension gets shifted by one. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, but that's why I was saying these, these things on the principal series, that condition just came from imposing normalizability. There are, I think, uh, well, and Andrea has worked with collaborators on these kind of things before, but there is a really strong indication that one should not be restricting. There may be a, an alternative basis uh, of operators, and for example, there was some indication of this in some recent work on in two two signature that perhaps, and also in what I'm going to be showing now, that there may be some other complete set of operators on the celestial sphere with integer dimension, uh, and these. The negative integer dimensions, of course, now we're going to say, oh, it's not unitary, but actually all of the soft operators will have negative, negative dimensions and their canonical conjugates, Andrea sort of uh, uh, said this, there is a sense in which they're canonically paired with these positive delta modes, which are goldstones, and it would be nice if one could make it partially, okay, if one understood it exactly what what the set of uh, operators should be uh, governing these uh, conformal, you know, these celestial theories. I, I don't think we fully understand, but so but, far but from Maria, what- uh, Anna, at the end, you, you want a Hilbert space for, for the, the asymptotic state. So how are you going to have an, uh, an Hilbert space if you, you don't have delta normalizable uh, uh, function uh, as a basis for, for the Fox space? If you're out uh, of the principal theory, you don't have delta normalizability, so you don't have a notion of Hilbert space uh, for. for I, this question about normalizability, it's, it's a great question, and I don't, I don't really have an answer to this question. Uh, I'm just saying that it, it's, yeah, I don't think it's fully understood, but there are various other norms involving the shadow and not involving the shadow. Like, there, are partic there may be some modification of what I'm telling you right now. With like, for example, just considering a different norm with respect to which perhaps uh, other wave functions with dimensions which are not on the principal series may be normalizable or delta function normalizable. And in particular, well, okay. So, so you... all the radiative states, they're still on the principal series, but all the asymptotic symmetries and also the, the ones that give rise to like global charges, like uh, charge conservation and energy conservation and so on, they all have a uh, real dimension and they can be either integer valued or half integer if you also consider fermions. That, that. And so these are like, yeah, should be, I mean, they are the physical in, in that sense that they are the symmetries of the space time. So. Um, yeah, but by physical here, I mean like uh, asymptotic states, like if you actually do some scattering of some. The ones that the, you have the usual radio, radial fall off conditions, they are given by this complex uh, conformal dimension. But you can also analytically continue between the principal series and uh, complex dimension or specific uh, integer or half integer valued dimensions. And uh, the whole story is not fully, uh, fully understood yet, I would say. But right. you know that there are states like the stress tensor which don't lie in the principal series and surely would uh, include the stress tensor in the, your theory. So uh, it's worth thinking about these uh, non-principal series states. And also in a moment, I'm going to show that if one just focuses on four point scattering, this structure in this complex delta plane, this analytic structure in this complex delta plane, we're going to see that these functions, these functions seen as a function of the sum of the external dimensions actually have poles more or less on uh, the real delta axis at even integers. And so, yeah, I mean, of course, you can you can consider scattering of whatever you want. It's just it's just that on these poles, the residues of these poles have certain interpretations. I'm I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But but I think it's fair to say that we don't fully understand uh, what yeah what the and in fact that's going to be one of my open questions at the end. What the spectrum is of of say. Uh, anyway, I did not mean to stop you. So you, you. You should go ahead, I think, because we are. Uh... Yeah. Uh... Oh, sorry, I have I have one last question about this. Uh, I apologize. So I don't understand because the 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 translation word identity seems to be solved just by it only affects the delta. So how do you get this restriction to z equals z bar? Ah, 
Uh, no, that's that that comes. I'm gonna discuss that later. It it you can see it from uh, just intuitively, if you have four point scattering in the bulk, right? It has to lie in the plane. And so this plane will cross, it will intersect the celestial sphere uh, at some, in some section on some circle, right? And so your asymptotic states from momentum conservation, they have to lie on a circle, but you can also see it by, uh, so, so the celestial amplitudes are obtained by taking Mellon transforms of the full momentum space amplitude, including right in, in with with the momentum conserving delta function. There, you're not supposed to strip that off. And so, for four point scattering, there's four constraints coming from there. One of which, actually, to just solve, there's four points, right? Uh, P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 with the signs uh, is equal to zero. Gives you four constraints. Three of them are going to, okay, okay I, I'm going to discuss it later. One of those constraints essentially uh, tells you that Z has to be equal to Z bar. Does it make sense? It makes some sense, but I'm confused as to how this uh, gels with the, this word identity relating the shift of amplitude. But okay, then maybe I'll understand it later. Okay, we can, yeah, we can come back to that. Because At least we have we have two variables, right? A number stem S and a number stem P, and, a, and delta and a Z. So the counting of variables. Yeah, they will. I will. Yeah, that's exactly what I, I was going to say. That again in in two slides you anticipate that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so let me very briefly uh, say because I I probably won't have time to talk about the infrared divergences, but um, let me just quickly finish the the properties or some of the properties we understand. Uh, one of them comes from soft theorems. So again, this is just the leading this time. Soft photon theorem can be written in this form. And one may wonder if there is a celestial analog of this. And the answer is, well, more or less, I, you can take it to be surprising or not. Um, uh, there is a celestial analog of this and the, the way to extract, um, uh, to, well, on the celestial sphere, in one can take a conformally soft limit by actually computing the residue uh, of the celestial amplitude uh, at uh, uh, delta. Well, in this case, delta is zero equal to one. So here, here, this corresponding instruction would be a, a helicity one spin one spin one particle, and the residue of this amplitude is then just gives the the standard conformally so-called conformally soft theorem. Um, so this is just to say that the soft photon in the bulk is mapped to, uh, or graviton uh, is mapped to uh, a delta equal to one celestial operator of corresponding spin. And moreover, uh, there exists a tower of soft currents associated with uh, uh, other poles in, in, in delta, so in particular a delta equal to zero operator of corresponding spin would correspond to a subleading soft particle, delta equal to minus one uh, operator would correspond to a sub subleading soft particle and so on and so forth, and these have been studied here. Uh, one interesting thing I would like to mention, perhaps <laughs> because I always get this question about what, what this is good for. Uh, so one thing uh, which is nice is that just purely within the celestial theory, one can uh, use the symmetries to write down uh, an OPE uh, between, say, gluons or gluons and gravitons, for example, and then use these symmetries. So for example, subleading uh, soft uh, symmetries in gauge theory and sub subleading soft theorems in uh, gravity to actually constrain the leading OPE coefficient um, of uh, gluons and gravitons. And this leading, this leading OPE coefficient actually can also be derived from just taking a collinear limit of uh, the corresponding bulk gravity or gauge theory scattering amplitude. But often that calculation to actually prove uh, collinear factorization is in particular in gravity is not so trivial. Uh, and it, in fact, it has only been done, I don't know, like 10, 20, 20 years ago or so. Uh, but from the celestial point of view, one just has to manipulate. One just writes down there's uh, two recursion relations which are obeyed by these, uh, by these OP coefficients, and one can solve them to uh, arrive essentially at the same 
well, and one can map it back to momentum space and, and arrive at collinear factorization from just from purely uh, symmetry uh, analysis. Okay, uh, so that, can that I just ask one quick question? Uh, the dot or dots you have there, um, ah. there are no universal soft theorems it's of not. factorization, but is there any nice structure, like any kind of factorization that's dependent on the theory um, or what's so the... I, uh, so I have not, uh, Andy and collaborators, uh, including Alfredo and Mina and Monica, have a paper coming up, I think, discussing uh, kind of the structure of... Uh, of sub sub leading soft modes. I think, I mean, Andy has been saying this, they form an algebra and so on and so forth. So I, I don't. It, I think yeah, I was just wondering from the amplitudes perspective, like even before going to celestial. Yeah, so um, from the amplitude perspective. But a sub 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 sub. <laughs> they're, What's not the factor? they're not universal, right? But when exactly. you're in yeah. theory, then they, it still makes sense to ask. I mean, they would just correspond to the uh, terms in an expansion, right? In, right. Subleading. So in some sense, they do contain, I mean, you. But is uh, it known that there are some combinations, like just from the 40 scattering amplitudes and momentum space perspective, that there's anything, any structure? There is um, something slightly related where uh, poles, well, in some sense, more or less, these, these things are related to poles at negative delta, where delta is the sum of these dimensions, and those uh, encode information about uh, the low energy effective field theory, the coefficients in the low energy effective field theory. So for four point scattering, but more generally for higher point scattering, these would uh, just correspond to pieces and some expansion in one of the Mandelstam invariants. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it's not fully fleshed out, but yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so what we're going to see now, so hopefully I don't have very much time left, but uh, it shouldn't be, uh, okay, this should be fast. So uh, using these ideas, one can uh, then, uh, we'll see that certain constraints on the coefficients of low energy uh, uh, in, in the low energy effective field theory actually map into constraints on the residues of simple poles in the complex delta plane. So we're gonna see that there's in, in quantum field theory in general, there, there are poles everywhere on, uh, on the real uh, axis at even integers. And um, in, in then imposing additional constraints amplitudes have to obey in the UV. So things like exponential suppression, uh, as one goes to high energies, for example, uh, as expected in quantum gravity due to for formation of black holes, uh, can be used to deduce that actually the celestial amplitudes in this context will have half of these poles being erased. So in particular, the poles on the positive uh, uh, real delta axis will not be there anymore. And so uh, these two facts put together give us a sharp probe uh, of whether you'll, you know, just by looking at the celestial amplitudes, one should be able to tell whether they correspond, they, they describe a theory of uh, gravity or not. Okay, and there is the story about soft hard, hard factorization, but uh, let me, let me first uh, uh, say these things. So the, um, again, so this is the same setup. These questions has, have been uh, kind of addressed a little bit before. We have a two to two scattering process. It's labeled by S and T, two Mandelstam invariants in momentum space. Um, and one can uh, uh, label S as omega squared and the ratio of T and S as uh, minus Z. So Z is just the cross ratio discussed before. And then uh, one can also define this parameter delta, uh, beta, which is the same, I mean, it's essentially up to a shift, is the same as this delta I described before. And uh, so in this case, one can then uh, look at the uh, structure of the celestial amplitude more uh, closely. And uh, well, just not even using symmetries or anything, one can just take the standard most general form of a momentum space four point amplitude and take a Mellin transform with respect to the four external lines. And as I said before, uh, this momentum conserving delta function imposes four constraints. Three of those constraints um, uh, actually tell you that the four 
that these four energies are proportional to one another. And the fourth constraint fixes Z to be equal to Z bar. So one in, in this using this parametrization of the momenta I showed before, one can rewrite this delta, uh, this momentum conserving delta function as a delta Z minus Z bar times three additional deltas, which fix the omegas to be proportional to one another. And as one does the Mellon transform with respect to the external energies, one saturates those three these three momentum conserving delta functions to generate a prefactor here, which is conformally covariant. And then what's left over is just one Mellon transform, which is now with respect to omega, or rather it would be with respect to sort of omega defined here. Uh, but where now the parameter here is not any of the independent dimensions, but it's uh, the uh, sum of all of the external dimensions minus four. So uh, any uh, celestial four-point function is going to be proportional. So this prefactor here, I can just emphasize, it's fully determined. We know exactly what it is. I'm just dropping it because I'm just going to focus on the structure uh, in this uh, beta. Uh, well, I'm just going to focus on the beta dependence, essentially. And so uh, a lot of the information is actually encoded in this Mellon transform uh, of, uh, of the just the momentum space scattering amplitude as a function of SNT. Now, one example one can consider is what happens if you just take this M of SNT to just be a power of S. And in that case, you immediately see that the Mellon transform is not well defined unless P is imaginary, uh, in which case one can do a change of variables to just write this as uh, the Fourier transform of one, which is the delta function in beta plus P. And so, uh, naively, this is telling us, well, that of course, uh, in momentum space, uh, a scattering amplitude which grows as a power of omega at high energies uh, is not quite well defined, but we already know that this won't typically be the case in a good theory of anything which basically, uh, well, some, something like this would badly violate unitarity, for example. So uh, just a simple example tells you that one has to input some information about the UV behavior of the scattering amplitude, which uh, perhaps might uh, lead to a kind of nicer singularity here. So instead of having delta functions, uh, one would get some other structure in, in beta. And indeed, this is the case. And the way to see this, for example, would be by studying a few examples. And one simple example is the case of a, a scalar scattering mediated by massive exchange. So here we, we uh, this is just a toy. I mean, it's just a, an example where we take the, T the S channel uh, tree level amplitude for this case and uh, uh, compute the corresponding uh, celestial amplitude. And this is just the standard integral which uh, gives a function of beta, which uh, is inversely proportional to sine pi beta divided by two, essentially. So we see from this that uh, there is an infinite number of poles at beta equal to 2n. And the way to understand these poles is uh, by uh, uh, actually doing an expansion of the momentum uh, space scattering amplitude around low energy and uh, high energy, so in particular, if uh, we, we can take this formula and expand it for small s, so the generic expansion is going to take this form as a, uh, as a power series in omega squared with some coefficients, which uh, depend on, uh, on z generically. And uh, so then, of course, this expansion would break down at scales, which are uh, roughly speaking m squared. So one has to cut off this integral at some scale, in which case, uh, term by term, instead of getting these uh, bad divergences, one will get uh, poles. And in particular, one will get poles at negative even betas. So at beta equal to minus 2n, where n is a positive integer. And the, the residues of these poles are directly related to the coefficients in this expansion, which are in turn related to coefficients in a low energy effective field theory. Uh, similarly, one can also do, in this case, one can also do an expansion around large S. And similarly, the only thing which is going to change is going to be these coefficients here. And n will now be minus n. So we'll see that, and one can see that um, 
that the poles then in on the positive uh, real beta axis is positive, uh, even integers are then related to uh, an expansion around S uh, going to infinity. So and generically, one would expect such a structure for, for uh, any, any quantum field theory amplitude because one, uh, we're gonna see also an example where one includes loops and what, what's that gonna imply for the celestial amplitude. But uh, in principle, at least at low energies, one always will have such an expansion. So one would always have these poles at, uh, and negative betas. Now, uh, another example is the case where um, the scattering amplitude is actually suppressed at very high energies. And uh, such an example arises non-perturbatively in quantum gravity where, uh, where um, one can consider scattering at high energy and uh, fixed impact parameter, in which case one expects uh, the amplitude to be exponentially suppressed uh, with, with a suppression um, proportional to the black hole entropy. So uh, roughly speaking, this amplitude is, there's going to be the black hole is going to have uh, a number of microstates uh, exponentially in the black hole entropy. And roughly speaking, this process is going to be suppressed by the inverse of that number, which is proportional to this uh, e to the minus uh, the entropy of the black hole. And so a toy model for, for this high energy behavior would be an amplitude which de decays exponentially with uh, s in units of, of some mass, say in the uh, Planck mass, for example. And uh, then in particular, one can also localize the celestial amplitude onto this regime by taking the large beta limit. And in this uh, large beta limit, then one can do a stationary phase approximation and just substitute uh, the momentum space amplitude by its lar la large energy uh, formula, this exponentially suppressed ex uh, factor, uh, to find the celestial amplitude, which then is just for, again, for the simple toy model is gonna be a gamma function in beta divided by two. What this formula shows is that uh, there are still poles at negative even integers, but uh, there are no poles on the positive uh, beta axis. And so more generally, we, we expect that uh, exponential suppression of momentum space scattering amplitude at high energies would erase half of these poles we saw uh, before. Roughly speaking, because well, such exponential does won't have a, an expansion around omega goes to infinity, but of course it will still have an expansion around omega goes to zero. And more generally, we'd expect that to be the case for, for the, the full amplitude. So to, to sum up, there is a sharp probe between quantum gravity amplitude and the quantum field theory amplitude in that quantum gravity amplitudes would expect to not have any poles on the positive real beta axis. Okay, and uh, two more uh, brief facts. I'm gonna wrap up after that. Um, one thing one may wonder about is how do loops change this picture? And the way they change it is by just uh, uh, introducing higher order poles in beta. So one can immediately see that one can dress this expansion in powers of omega by powers of logarithms. And uh, each of those terms will then map into a higher order pole in beta, depending on how many, you know, how many parts of the logarithms we have. And so in this case, the picture would be that the residues at these higher order poles would be related to these coefficients of the logs. And uh, another thing one can look at is uh, uh, what happens if one has a tower of massive exchanges in the theory? Uh, in, in that case, it turns out that in the limit when beta is very large and negative, the celestial amplitude is dominated by the lowest mass exchange, which can be seen from, from the three level formula I showed before. So in the limit as beta goes to minus infinity as we take m to be small, um, Oh, sorry, as we take beta to minus infinity, if we have a bunch, a range of masses, this, uh, this thing is going to be dominated by, by the lowest mass. And so the sum is going to be dominated by the lowest mass exchange. And uh, I should say that all of these properties are very general. They're just based on uh, Mellon transforms of uh, uh, simple functions. But uh, one can show explicitly that celestial 
uh, amplitudes in string theory actually obey all of these properties. Um, and with that, um, well, I had this other part about infrared divergences, but I think I should, uh, I should wrap up. And uh, I should say that there are a lot of open questions, uh, which some of them uh, are on the slide here, but uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, you had many questions. If you need five minutes to, to finish your talk, I think it's fine. Um, I think, okay, probably five minutes won't be enough to discuss and sort of this topic, we can discuss this topic. If people have questions about infrared divergences, because there were some at the beginning, I can, I can maybe refer to some slides and say the story in a few words. But I think basically uh, at this point, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good point to stop and say that, so some of the open questions are of course, I, I showed you that, um, uh, the story, well, I focused on basically mass, mass, the scattering of massless particles, but uh, all of these things should be uh, generalized to, to theories with massive particles. And as Andrea was saying before, that there are uh, formulas for celestial amplitudes with massive particles. They involve basically certain integrals. Basically the Mellon transform is traded by some integral over bulk to boundary propagator in some slicing of the space time. But uh, many of the statements I just made are not fully understood in, uh, in this case when one includes massive particles. Now, another question which uh, came up was what the spectrum actually is. And I would say that this is, this is an open question and there are perhaps ways to go about it. One of them is to try to study a conformal block decomposition perhaps of these amplitudes. And I think we do have some progress on that. Um, and uh, well, it turns out that these integer delta modes play a role in that case. And there has also been some recent work on scattering and choo-choo signature, where again, there is an, an alternate set of uh, conformal primary wave functions, which one can study, which now diagonalize the rotations. And in that case, it seems like um, these integer delta modes uh, will uh, may form perhaps a complete uh, set of states, but uh, again, that has not been uh, fully fleshed out. Um, well, one one of the most interesting questions, in my opinion, I think, is whether one can use all of this all of this to actually find new constraints uh, on scattering amplitudes. So we know that, for example, dispersion relations. Uh, tell us a lot uh, already about just momentum space scattering amplitudes. They constrain coefficients in a low energy effective field theory to, to be positive and perhaps even lower bounded or bound lower and upper bound in particular ways. Uh, and it would be interesting to see whether uh, just this framework could tell you uh, a bit more about that. I, I, I can, if there's questions, yeah. Um, and then, one also sort of in this line of ideas, it would be interesting to um, see if perhaps once one understands all of the constraints, if one can pin down, uh, for example, a two to two gravity and scattering amplitude in quantum gravity. And another interesting, I think, thing to be looking at is uh, uh, conformal, celestial conformal field theory in the region limit, there seems to be uh, perhaps connections to uh, recent work in both scattering amplitudes and uh, conformal field theory in the study of these light ray operators and uh, average null energy conditions. Um, there's, there is perhaps a relationship between the soft operators and these integrated operators on null lines in, in this context. So it would be interesting to, to see if there's something there, basically. So thank you very much. And please, if there's uh, questions, I'm very happy to answer. Hey, thank you, Anna. Well, le let's uh, unmute uh, ourselves if you want to just uh, thank you to Anna. And uh, let's go for questions then. Maybe I should. Yeah, please un unmute yourself. 
Can you say a bit about why the 2 or 2 graviton scattering in quantum gravity would have a chance of being unique, what you mean by that? Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I, that would be a, um, how to say, uh, a dream prop. Well, I, I just, I, I wouldn't, I didn't mean that there is a unique, I'm, ju I'm just saying that there may be a chance. So there has been a recent paper by Minwala and collaborators where they extensively just wrote down all of the allowed uh, Two to two scattering amplitudes in gravity, so all of the allowed structures. And one may wonder if that set, for example, they wrote down could be further constrained using, const well, using additional constraints of the kind I described. But perhaps, no, perhaps there is not going to be. I I'm just saying that the more constraints there are, uh, the more constrained the amplitudes could be, and perhaps one can. Uh, perhaps one, once one understands all of the constraints, one could use them too. But, but there is a lot of distinguished 2-2 uh, uh, graviton amplitude in string theory. So even if they are not written to all order in, uh, as non-perturbative, they have different limits at cusp, at least at the weak coupling, et cetera, or strong coupling. Different. So we know that there are a lot of possible 2-2-2 two -two scattering in quantum gravity, I would say. Isn't the answer that they're all zero? I mean, uh, since you're not discussing the issue of IR divergences, I'm not sure what it means to ask about the unique two to two graviton scattering amplitude, right? Well, uh, in four dimension, of course, yes, there is no two to two in uh, any. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> if you don't I mean, state, I mean, they I mean, don't exist. That, that you can, I mean. That's again not something which is fully well understood, but I, I, there is there are these dress amplitudes, and I, I have not discussed them. But there is a way to well, so they have been foolish and others in the past. They have wrote re, well, they have proposed a way to define an infrared finite scattering amplitude in QED, and that story generalizes to gravity. You may be bothered by that because it breaks Lorentz invariance and it involves some soft hard cutoff and there seems to be some ambiguity in that description. But uh, one thing I have not discussed here is that in, in, the celestial, in the celestial framework, there is perhaps a way to uh, single out one of those Fedev foolish dressings, which preserves Lorentz invariance and uh, gives rise to infrared finite uh, celestial amplitudes, at least in principle. I mean, in okay. practice, of course, I, one would like to compute it, but- Has it really been understood? I thought there were some issues for in non-abelian gauge theory, so I imagine also- Non-abelian gauge theory, that's an, still an open question, yes. But for gravity, no? Well, gravity in some sense is, is uh, as far as I know, is more similar to, to QED in, in the sense that it, well, there is nothing non-abelian about it. I, I think those dressings are understood for gravity. I mean, they're definite, they definitely are. In, but I agree with you. In non-abelian gauge theories, they're not well understood because, yeah. Why do you say it's similar to an abelian gauge? I don't understand. Well, because... Yeah. Uh, it's relevant, so your loop are less and less dangerous in the IR, uh, so they are not really bothering you. Yeah, there is just this class of ladder diagrams which uh, give right. I mean, it's mainly coming from the fact that in not in in both gravity and QED, the classes of diagrams which give rise to infrared divergences are these ladder diagrams, um, and they can be summed up. And they both, they, the, in other words, the soft factor is fully, un, this soft hard factorization in this paper by Weinberg from 65, he wrote down formulas for both QED and gravity, where he resummed the infrared divergences into known exponent, exponentials of some factor of this form, I should, I, see. Uh, I should say. So, okay, this is, this is the QED example. So there is some splitting of this form and this coefficient have, has been written down by Weinberg and there is a similar formula for gravity. For QED, it's not, uh, sorry, for QCD, this B here is much more complicated and it comes from the non-abelian nature of the theory. And I don't think in, Q, in QCD one can, cannot, I mean, Andrea had a, a 
paper on the supersymmetric, I guess, case more recently, perhaps you can comment. But as far as I as far as I understand in, in QCD, this this factor here is not fully well understood. I mean, people understand, you know, to two loops, but there are corrections, I think, to higher and higher loop orders. Uh, okay. Yep. I now lost the, I somehow lost the uh, thing with, with everyone. So. Uh, uh, you, you mean the, we are still here, if you are wondering, yeah. Uh, no, I, I know you, I know you are there. It's just that I don't see you anymore. Somehow it went to the back. And I don't know how to how to. Uh, well, if you escape and then go back, you can certainly put it back. Or uh, yeah. Okay, maybe let's see. When you're sharing screen, you should still be able to see the the participants. Yeah, yeah, but if you lose them, then. Uh, I have two. The thing is that I have two screens, ah. and I think it's okay. I'm, I moved it to the other side. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, other questions? I was. I was wondering if you can say anything about the complex Z plane. Yes. So that's a, you that's talked about the delta plane. Yeah, that's a great question. And we've been studying this for, uh, I've said this before, for uh, a year or so now. And we understand, yeah. So, and actually using one of your recent, uh, these works on this alpha space turns out to be useful in studying these. Um, the idea is that, okay, I left out this Z dependent. So here I left out a conformally covariant structure, uh, which is fine. One usually strips it off if one tries to study, for example, a conformal block decomposition of this function. But uh, in, in this conformal block examples, one wouldn't strip off uh, this sort of factor, but the one which is uh, less, I mean, which is not symmetric, which only has the symmetry in like one, two, and three, four, for example. So if one, there is a relationship, of course, between that one and this one up to a function of Z and the external dimensions. So that factor will always multiply this piece. So there's two sources of Z dependence. There is a Z dependence, which is sort of universal, which comes from that factor. There is a Z dependence coming from this function. And then the end of the day, if you want to do a conformal block decomposition, you have to take both of them into account. And also this delta function in Z minus Z bar, actually. Uh, there's been some works where they said, okay, just like, let's just strip that off and uh, try to, to study that. But we wanted to understand basically the full well, we, we, there was a sense in which this delta function in Z minus Z bar uh, appeared to be related to translational symmetry. And so one would expect that the decomposition involving such a delta function in Z minus Z bar would include an infinite number of exchanges, which are related by translations. And in fact, one can see, one can do uh, a decomposition in some simple case where one just has, for example, just contact four point scalar scattering where essentially this function is not, not gonna give you any additional Z dependence and just study, just to do a decomposition of this Z dependent function out front. And uh, using these partial waves, uh, one can then deform the contours and write down uh, this, these amplitudes as a sum of our conformal blocks. And one indeed sees, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, one sees these exchanges at integer deltas, at positive integer deltas. And one also sees an additional term, which is sort of like a continuum of exchanges, which seem to be light ray transforms of these integer delta modes. So they, they seem to have complex spin and delta equal to one. And kind of one can put the two together and show that the, you know, all of the terms cancel up to a term which generates this delta function in Z minus Z bar. And that I think there is, yeah, it's an interesting mm. show. This has been published or it's... Uh... It's work in progress, hopefully. It will be published at some point. Uh, yeah. Actually, well, but, there, is subtlety, there is a subtlety there. I should say that the thing which has been stopping us from saying anything about it is that even in, there is, you see, there is this Z dependent function, which one can do a decomposition fine, and it has a nice factorization property, which I would say that a priori is not expected necessarily, right? Because not any random function of Z and Z bar should have a, a conformal block decomposition which factorizes. 
Well, and that you're not. So, sorry, you say it factorizes, but you still have this, I mean, the delta function coming out, right? So it doesn't really factorize yeah. into holomorphic and it, The Z dependent function factorizes, they, for, there, is a delta, there is a piece which depends on beta, which sits out front and doesn't depend on Z at all. So for example, in this contact example, there would be a delta function, there would be a delta function in beta. In the case of a massive exchange, say one, uh, it, the z-dependence is sort of the same if one looks at the t-channel amplitude of four scalars, um, the t-channel amplitude. Uh, it's not gonna give you again any additional z-dependence, but it's gonna have these poles. It's gonna have the one over sine pi beta in it. And right now we're still trying to understand how to think about this prefactor, which depends on, on beta. Because there is no sense in which one can split that into something which just depends on, say, delta one and delta two and delta three and delta four to absorb it somehow in the OP coefficients. Or it would be great if we understood that as coming from some kind of degeneracy. Or I, yeah, but I, it's not super clear how how to think about that right now. But, but did oh. I understand correctly that uh, always it should be morphic in delta? That is uh, for a quantum amplitude, uh, even. Uh, that, it Did I be... understood correctly that there is no branch cut in delta, so you will always have a meromorphic function? Is that what you were claiming, right? Oh, actually, we looked a bit at this as well, and it turns out that I think, uh, so in gravity, there won't be any, but I think if one looks at um, uh, some quantum field theory where the coupling is renormalized, um, uh, one can use the renormalization group, right, to write down a formula for the coupling. And I think if one transforms that formula, then one, one can get the in, indeed. There is, okay, I, I have to remind myself that there is something about, there are some cases where one may see branch cuts. But certain, I think it, it was, uh, I think it was quantum field theory rather than quantum gravity. Because in quantum, yeah, th there is some distinction there as well. Um, if, but one has to study basically these low corrections. You, you mean you need marginal coupling and uh, normalization of marginal coupling to get the branch cut or something else? Um, why marginal couplings are not relevant? Because for me, the only difference I see with gravity is that uh, uh, the, the coupling is irrelevant. Uh, oh, irrelevant, but mar mar it can also be irrelevant, right? Why ah, would would give that as well? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So something along these lines, but I don't. We didn't. Okay, thank you. Is there any uh, other question? Yes, I want. Um, so you mentioned the the uh, the removal of this would be poles on a positive axis, and there's mm -hmm. some sort of um, interpretation in terms of the the flat space analog of the ADS resolution of the bulk point singularity. That's right, just in the sense that, uh, that, yeah, so there seems to be some connection which uh, Nima noticed between uh, um, the bulk point singularity and this erasure of these faults. Um, as far as I understand, I mean, there is a, the, the, in this paper by Zhibuedov and collaborators on looking for a bulk point, there is a formula for, uh, you know, when one gets uh, uh, in what sort of config, there are certain configurations for which uh, conformal correlators develop some singularities and they say that it corresponds to a ball point limit and there is some integral involved. They have to take some sort of flat space limit of those and the formulas which entered there seem to be, very, I mean, they're very similar to the phenomenon which seems to be erasing Okay, I uh, I don't fully I don't think I can say anything super coherent about that because I have not thought a very long I, I have not thought very much about it, but I can tell you that there is again, I mean there is a mechanism there which where there is some kind of melon transform, some exponential, which erases uh, some of the poles as far as I remember. But I, the connection is is, but you is, erase sort of infinitely many poles, no? Like uh, full UV asymptotics where you you erase sort of half of the, the weights in the, I mean, not the weights, but 
Right. Uh... Sorry, Trent, but maybe it's time to close the official question session. Uh, I see that already people like considered that it was finished, but uh, uh, and then we can go for an official question with Anna as long as Anna. Yeah, 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 that that sounds great. So, so let's thank Anna last time, and uh, and I uh, I stop uh, to record.